Welcome to Countdown to the Semifinals delivered by Wendy's. Live from the rock and roll capital of the world, the women's NCAA Final Four is ready to rock the city of Cleveland. And what a historic Final Four it is. Game one, we got the undefeated Gamecocks of South Carolina taking on the unlikely three-seed NC State. And then our nightcap will feature a couple of Player of the Year winners in Caitlin Clark and Paige Beckers. Welcome on to our set sandwich right in between Progressive Field and Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. As you can tell, it's a little bit chilly outside, but we are set to have a great show previewing the Final Four. <laughs> Alongside LaChina Robinson, I'm Sam Rabbit, and we have a very special guest joining us, USC head coach Lindsey Gottlieb. Coach, thanks for joining us. I thought you might bring some of the warm weather from Southern California with you, but what was the deal with that? I definitely didn't. I think it's a throwback to my days in Cleveland. Everyone here wanted to make me feel welcome at home, so we brought the, we brought the cold. I, I know you've been around this game for a long time. A coach, a player, uh, as a fan now, what are you most excited about this weekend? What are you keeping an eye out for? Well, first of all, Cleveland's an incredible sports town yep. and has been a great host. But this is so much star power women's basketball, so much excitement. I'm looking forward to two really great games. Um, in, uh, fantastic coaches, players in front of us. I think it has the potential to be the best weekend of women's basketball in a long, long time. I agree with you, Coach. I mean, thinking about how long you and I have both been a part of the women's game, this is incredible. I mean, everything we've seen as a part of this March Madness, including your team and Juju Walk and everything that she brings to our sport. But I want to take you back because I was there in 2013 when you took the Cal Bears to the Final Four. What a moment for you for that program. When you put your mindset back there as a head coach, what is it like preparing for today's games? I think the balance for a coach at this moment is balancing the hoopla and the excitement of the Final Four. You want your teams to enjoy it. And at the same time, you have a routine that's gotten you to this place for 35 games. So you also want to keep the prep that's, you know, your players are comfortable with. So I think that's the big balance. Once the ball goes up, I think everyone feels better. Yeah, All the, you know, the pomp and circumstance is done, and then they get to just hoop. Yeah, just get to have some fun. Yes. I love it. Uh, I don't know if Lisa Bluter has gotten in your ear, but if she would have, what would you tell her about the scouting report going up against a player like Paige Beckers? Well, considering she just dropped 28 on us, I don't know that Lisa's calling me. Um, Paige is incredible. Uh, I think it's also a compliment to the UConn offense. She moves a ton. She's a threat off the ball. She's a passing threat. I would say, I mean, look, we played them four days ago. It's still a little raw. We'd like to have our yeah. team here, um, but they're a really worthy team. I think with Paige, you have to make her shots as difficult as possible. I would probably switch out a little bit more on her than we did. I would. She's so quick with the catch and shoot, maybe trap more ball screens or, or, or jump someone two bodies at her, but she's such a passing threat that it's hard to do that as well. Coach, I'm going to put you back on the spot because you did spend time here in Cleveland yes. um, when you were coaching yes. on the NBA side. What is the must-see attraction downtown? It could be a restaurant. It could be whatever. Just throw it out there. What, what do the fans need to do when they're here in the lane? Oh, my gosh. There's so many things. I literally just took my children this morning to the Botanical Garden. I know that's not probably the one that people would think, but that place is incredible. Uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, is great. Uh, there's so many cool things about this city. Uh, it was a little warmer going to see the shores of Lake Erie, which is really very beautiful. But I'm a big Cleveland fan and uh, just happy to be back here with, with the great community that welcomed me last the last time I was here. I love it. So you guys have had a great season, obviously, yeah. right? Making it to the Elite Eight, first time since 94. You've heard all the stats. Uh, I know Kenzie Forbes declared for the WNBA draft, but you look forward to next season. USC has got something cooking there in Southern California. When you get Juju coming back, three McDonald's All-Americans are coming in as well. What excites you most about the future of the Trojan program? Uh, well, we think we're just only just beginning. While there's still a little heartbreak to not have the team here, I think if anyone saw, you know, Juju's reaction to that loss and what a competitor she is, it's only going to make her, I think, work harder. Um, she's also a terrific leader. And so I think that the culture of the program is really strong. We've got great young players coming in. Uh, we have returning players that have now really learned how to lead. Um, and so we're super excited about, you know, what the future holds for us. And I have to ask you with that, Coach, you've got – amazing talent coming in, but it is a little bit of a different challenge with the transfer portal yep. now in, in women's basketball. How do you approach the off season? And could there be any major moves coming to uh, USC? Uh, well, I, I do think we all get to put on our GM hat right. in the off season now. And, and certainly Kobe Altman and the Cavs taught me how to do that. Um, you have to be flexible as a coach. You know, you want to build with your own culture and improving uh, the players that you have. And at the same time, if there's a chance to add veteran leadership or a piece that you may not have, of course, we're all looking to do that. So we're in a good spot. 
I think USC is a place that a lot of people want to be. Uh, I think, you know, we have a core that people want to play with. Um, you know, we have a we have a selfless superstar, and that's a good good uh, situation to have, and young talent coming in. So uh, I, I think none of us are going to stand pat this offseason. We're all trying to get better. And add to that, a fantastic head coach, right? Well, thank you, Lachina. I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, thank Coach Lindsey Gottlieb of the USC you. Trojans. Best of luck uh, in next season as well. We move along here. Uh, time now for Fueling the Run, delivered by Wendy's, where we take a look at Iowa and their superstar, really their supernova, Caitlin Clark, coming off an all-world performance performance against LSU, 41 points, including a tournament tying, nine threes, 12 assists as well, even when LSU tried to stop her. Haley Van Lithlachina at one point just gave the Jordan shrug. I got nothing for you. <laughs> That's, That's what we got. She's got a chance, Caitlin does, to add to an already monumental legacy that she has built at Iowa by bringing them their first national championship. What's impressed you most about what Caitlin has done so far in March? Boy, the list is long, right, um, when you bring up the name of Caitlin Clark. But for me, it's the duality of the tenaciousness of who she is on the court, looking for her shots, the logo three, the fearlessness and the courage with which she plays for. That's one side of Caitlin. But the other side is the composure. When you listen to her in press conferences, she just gets it. She understands that this is an opportunity, not just for her. We hear her name all the time, but she thinks about her teammates. She thinks about her coaching staff. Very selfless player. Very cool, calm, and collect. And I feel like that composure, even though we're looking at her yeah. hit these bombs with three-point land, that's how she feels inside. And that is why it is fun to watch a Caitlin Clark on this level, because when the stakes are at their highest, she is so poised in these moments it can bring her A game when it really counts. I see a lot of number 22 jerseys behind us. We got a lot of Caitlin Clark fans that are here. The question that Gino and his staff are trying to figure out, and they've been racking their brains, no question about it, is, well, how do you stop her? Because so far, no one's really been able to do it. And, you know, you could try to throw a bunch of different defenses at her. You could try to go box in one. You could try to just let her get hers, which I know you're not a fan of. But, but how does UConn try and slow down this train that is Caitlin Clark? Well, I had a conversation with Lisa Bluter earlier on in the season, and I said, Coach, like, how do you prepare for what teams are going to throw at Caitlin Clark? And she said, LaChina, we have seen it all. Teams have thrown the kitchen sink plus the bathroom sink at Caitlin yeah. Clark when, it's, when it comes to defending her. High hedging, trapping, switching. I mean, everything you could, denial. Um, and so she said nothing really phases her anymore because she's seen so many, so many different types of defenses. But to me, the key is really not letting her get comfortable. Yeah. And when it comes to any great player, what do you hear? You're not gonna, you're not gonna stop her, but we're gonna try to slow her down. So can you put different types of defenders on her that make her have to think? Maybe uh, Anika Buell, who's going to get into her and be a, more, a little more physical. Can you put some length on her? We may see Paige guarding Caitlin at some point. So um, I, I, it's tough. When you can't really stop her, but I do think that depending on the type of defender that's guarding her, you can keep her uncomfortable. There's something that we're not really talking about as well is what, what kind of play the whistle will have tonight. We saw West Virginia in the second round be able to get up and guard Caitlin Clark a little bit more aggressively. If the whistle's tight against UConn, a team that's already depleted a little bit in their roster, I don't know. That could get interesting. Sam, you know how to ruin my day bringing up officials. We're going to hope that the officials bring their A game. We're going to hope that the officiating crew brings their A game. I'm just, you know, hey, wishing for the best. But you're right. With a short roster like UConn has, they get into foul trouble. It could be tough for Gino Oriema. But the good thing for him, he's been there. He's done that. He's coached his teams to 11 national championships, seen a little bit of everything. So, um, Hopefully the whistle is not a fact. Let's just say that. <laughs> I can see you were getting a little right. bit upset. Did you see me? You were, you Did you were getting see the heated steam a little bit there. Uh, coming out of my head. <laughs> uh, a lot of focus is on Caitlin Clark, rightfully so. But when Iowa is playing at their best, her teammates are getting involved, right? We saw that play out in the Elite Eight. Sydney Falter uh, doubled her season scoring average. She put up 16 points, right? And we also had Kate Martin adding 21. So, what do Clark's teammates need to do in order for Iowa, the collective, 
to be successful. They've just got to play their part. Um, everyone plays their role so well in the, on that Iowa team, whether it's Stolke running the floor or Gabby Marshall who's shooting the ball at 47% from long range in March or Kate Martin who was just the do-it-all player. Everyone's got to play their part. But it's the overall transition game that I think is going to be most effective against Connecticut. And to me, the way they pass the ball in the open court, in particular, Caitlin Clark, and can get easy layups on the other end, that is easy offense. You don't even allow Connecticut the opportunity to guard you. So can they get out and run in transition? Can Sydney Folter get involved in the way she can run the floor, um, spotting up for threes in, in transition as well, and hoping to catch Connecticut in some situations where they don't have the right personnel matched up? I mean, I'm not too concerned about Iowa's offense. They average yeah. over 90 points per game. But the transition game, I think for both of these teams, will be a big factor. I don't know if this is a sign, LaChina, but right when we started talking about the Caitlin Clark, came the sun out. came out. Woo! I don't know. That I might be a me, sign. Me, time, to, time to get loose now. That Sam. might be a sign. I can take the blanket off. <laughs> Yesterday, we got a chance to catch up with some of the teams that are here. Uh, we put our journalist hats on. We asked the hard-hitting questions, and the UConn Huskies were up first. We got Ashton Shade here in the UConn women's locker room. Ashton, we're hitting uh, all the hard-hitting questions here. Your favorite UConn Husky mascot over the last several decades is what? Um, I think this one, is, I think the 1959 one is hilarious. <laughs> um, but I don't think it's my favorite. I think the 80s and 90s one looks really cool. And obviously, like, I love our, yeah. like, the one we have now. But I think this one's the coolest. 2002, 2013. Uh, it, just, it just pops out to me. Also, the, that's the level that I saw mostly growing up, so. I mean, I feel like like that's the one I grew up with, yeah. but I feel like that one's too obvious. It is the best looking one. But I feel like 80s, 90s, like that one's cool. So no love for the 1959 Yukon Husky? You know, I, I remember seeing that for the first time, and I just remember like me and my mom, we were just clowning it, because <laughs> we're like, no offense to the person who's like, you know, but like, what's what's going on? I thought it was a joke too when I first saw that, when I was, when I got here, but I was like, oh wait, this isn't a joke, that was actually like their logo. The 1959 one, it looks a little creepy. <laughs> what about 1959? Yeah. Yeah, that was the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the best way to put it. All right, how about your favorite uh, Genoism or, or an impression of, of Coach? You got anything? I mean, you got to do the, you got to do this, the Italian man, you know, everything, everything, don't box out, you know. Oh my gosh, yes, he always does this. I mean, it's usually like here, here, hands above the head, so yeah. This speaks a lot of words to us. If he doesn't have to say anything, just this. What, is, what does it mean? The Italian in him, he just like, when he gets frustrated or mad, he'll just be like, like that, so. <laughs> All right, now let's check out our most reliable player brought to you by Xfinity. And to help us do that is Andrea Carter. Let's hear it for Andrea Carter, everybody. How about that ovation, huh? Thank you, thank you, thank you. You stole my son joke. I was going to say the son came out when I got here, but Caitlin's okay. uh, <laughs> It's fine, it's fine. Well, let's talk about who Caitlin's going to be going up against tonight, and that would be the UConn Huskies. Uh, look, Paige Buckets has lived up to the nickname, right? Yeah. She's putting up 28 points per game combined between the Big East tournament and the NCAA tournament so far. That's up from about 21 points per game in the regular season. I think it's actually the biggest jump of any player from the regular season through the first four games of the NCAA tournament so far. So, Dre, how, should, how has she been able to take that next step and be that next level scorer for her team in March? I think Paige has finally realized that at least every time she touches the ball, she has to look to score. She has to think score and have that scoring mindset. At times, Paige, she's so good at finding her teammates. She's so good at playing with others. But her just looking to score and being aggressive creates more for her teammates. So I think once that clicked for Paige, she really learned how to kind of walk the fine line between doing too much and taking over. And at times, they have simply needed her to take over because she's just that good. Yeah, and it seems like Gino had been pushing her the whole time, like, look for your shot, look for your shot. And now, I mean, averaging 28 points per game, she's looking for a shot. Andrea, one thing that the people may not know about you that I happen to know because I called your game to Tennessee, you were an outstanding defender, scrappy, tenacious. I mean, you 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 risk your body on the defensive end to get a stop. So I'm gonna I want you to put your defensive hat on. 
How would you slow down Paige Beckers? How would you slow down Caitlin Clark? Give us just a quick and dirty answer to that from the from the guard. From, we want to see. The guard. <laughs> yeah, I think. I think from a guard perspective, you have to think about dictating. And so you have to think about pushing them one way, but then jumping to push them the other way, right? If my hands are high, then you want them to dribble, so now I'm gonna go back low, right? So just really trying to make the offensive player react to you. Now it's so hard because they're so good. Like that's the thing about Caitlin and Paige is they end up manipulating the defense. There aren't many defenders that can actually force them into doing anything. So I think in that case, you gotta be super reactive. Like if you see Paige go one way, you gotta jump that way but then they're so good at counters it's almost like boxing you know i love boxing you do you so do. you've got to think though with the great players you got to think one step ahead because if she gets you to lean right you have to know okay now she's probably gonna go left yes and if you can jump that and beat her to that next move but it's really hard because you got a lot going on you got to think i'm thinking about her next move but somebody's probably coming to set a screen somebody's probably yelling that there's no help on the back side there's so much going <laughs> yeah. on in your mind but if you could think one step ahead to what they're probably going to do you'll be in a slightly better position. As much as we don't want to pit Paige and Caitlyn against each other in this game, I mean, that's what it's going to be. It's a Paige and Caitlyn show. So with that being said, I know you've already answered this question on the L Duncan podcast, but uh, Lachina, I'll start with you. Would you rather have Paige or Caitlyn in this game? Ooh, boy. Um, that's a toughie. That's a toughie. You know... Don't. I, I, did you answer this already? I'm not telling you any of the She you on the podcast. <laughs> she did. She did answer it. Um, man. I, let me, let me tell, let me just give you my background okay. first. Fair. Okay. Um, this is, you know what we call my this? Answer. Tiptoeing. <laughs> we call this tiptoeing. My, my answer is not about either one of their skills or who I think is the better player. I have been truly inspired by the resilience of Paige Beckers. Mm. Yeah. Her story and what she's had to fight back from, from injuries. I mean, imagine being at the mountaintop and then getting to Connecticut and experiencing injuries that could have derailed her career. Not even just the physical aspect, but the mental aspect of what it takes yeah. to come back from something like that. I, mean, I am truly in awe of what we're seeing on the court from her right now, playing at the high, highest level. So. Because I love a good story, I'm a storyteller myself, a great ending for Paige Beckers would be, obviously to win the national championship, I don't know if they can be South Carolina, but to take down Caitlin Clark in Iowa would just be an incredible part of her story. So when I answered this question, it was kind of like, who would you build a team around? Okay, is that fair. what you were asking me? Or are you asking, like, who do you who think do you is going to have success? Who would you rather have in this game? If you were UConn, if you were Iowa, would you rather have Paige or Caitlin? Oh, well, if I'm, if I'm Iowa, in this situation, yeah. Caitlin is the perfect player to have. Fair. Because not only does she, is she so great at scoring, but she is so great at putting the defense out of position. And what happens when you're the defender and you're out of position? You foul. What can UConn not afford to do more than anything else in this game? They can't afford to foul. So having Caitlin out there on the floor for Iowa is perfect because she's so good at that. Now, having Paige for UConn is also perfect because she's so versatile. So when I talked about if I were building a team yeah. like from scratch yeah. and I wanted to start with one of those two players, I would pick Paige because of the versatility. If the three-pointer isn't falling, she's got the mid-range game. She has the back-to-the-basket game. She has the finishes at the rim. She has a little more defensive instincts on that side of the floor. So when you think about having an off night, I think a player that's a little more versatile can recover from those type of things. You talk about tiptoeing. You started with Kaylin, backed into Paige. I mean, she just basically, you know what I'm saying? And then I got myself right. no, to right. the, I didn't even need a re I didn't need a re You get paid good money to talk. So sure do. you do it well. I sure do. I sure do. The best part about it is there's no wrong answer. They're right. both Player yeah. of the Year award winners, yep. and they're both going to be battling it out tonight. A lot of unknowns going into the final four here tonight. We will have answers. Uh, like what Dawn Staley is going to be rocking on the court tonight. We know she always brings it with a fits. We got a Gucci. chance to ask some of her players <laughs> what they think she might be rocking and what they have liked so far. Whatever it is, I can't. We're now asking everybody some of the fits for Dawn Staley through the first four games of the tournament. What has been your favorite? This is hard. Every time she comes out with her fit on, I'm just like, mm -hmm. can I can I have that, please? <laughs> that one right there against UNC. The brown one. And I, when she walked in, I said, you got a crop top on? I like that one. I like the one with the navy blue. And I like the black. 
the Gucci. She likes Louis Gucci. She likes everything. My favorite is this one. This one is tough, but it's like clean and chill. She's like, this is not no crop top. I said, yes it is, lift your arms up. And she didn't want to lift her arms up, but that was my best fit. I like that fit. The blue one. Yeah, I like blue, and she looks good in blue. The Elite Eight one versus Oregon State. Okay. I think that's my favorite one. Is there any one of these that you think you could rock pretty good? All of them. I, I taught her before I needed to go to her closet and just go shop there. <laughs> All right, time now for Seize the Moment, presented by Gainbridge. South Carolina enters the Final Four undefeated for the second straight year. They have lost just one game in the last year, and, well, that came a season ago to Iowa in the semis. Uh, LaChina, what do they need to do to seize the moment tonight and make it to the title game on Sunday? This is easier said than done, Sam, because we are at the Final Four, and right. there is so much hoopla, and the spotlight is out here, and all these amazing fans have come to see these four teams. But what I will say, South Carolina has to stay loose. Y'all keep hearing. South Carolina has to stay loose. That is what I love about this team, is that they play so relaxed and that's not something that you would expect from the team that doesn't have a ton of experience right. when they have lost big leads let teams get in get back into games at the end Dawn Staley doesn't call a timeout she really trusts this team. There's just a sense of confidence, a different level of confidence that allows this team to play very relaxed. So I think they just can't let the nerves get to them. Of course, you're going to feel those butterflies the first few moments, but then they've got to settle in and do what they've done all year, and that's play cool, calm, and collect. You mentioned a, a shift. Have you noticed a shift in how Dawn has gone about coaching this team compared to, say, years prior, even last year? Yes, there is a higher level of trust. Considering the age of this team, meaning the, the, the sure. experience level, Dawn has let them play through their mistakes. Um, she seems very, very trusting of this team. Um, you know, and I don't know if it's that Dawn's getting older or the team's younger. And she's like, listen, I can't, these gray hairs, right? Like <laughs> when you bring in the, the younger team. But uh, yeah, I have seen a shift and I, and I feel like she really trusts this team and it's, it's beautiful to watch because they kind of are allowed to learn their way through their mistakes and look at where it's gotten. All right, so we've talked about South Carolina. We've talked about Iowa. We've talked about UConn. We're missing one. We are missing one. That would be the NC State Wolfpack. Do we have NC State Wolfpack fans here? Let's hear, let's hear what Oh, we are. We are. <laughs> they said that they were going to be the... These are Iowa fans that want NC State. I see some of the back Carolina. I see some Wolfpack red. Um, so they said that NC State said they were going to be the party crashers yeah. at the Final Four. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people thought that they would be in this spot. They were picked to finish eighth in the ACC preseason poll. They didn't win the ACC regular season title. They didn't win the ACC tournament title in Greensboro. Keep yet, going, Sam. Tell them all the things they didn't do. Yet here they are. <laughs> but out of the four teams that are here, LaChina, NC State might have had the uh, least stressful time getting here, winning in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight by double figures. There's something to be said for that. There is. And I'll be honest with you, I picked NC State to be here. Um, there is something about this team that's really special, and, and I think a big part of it is their backcourt. What we've seen from Sanaya Rivers and Isaiah James, like this has been a phenomenal run. To play against a Texas team, a Stanford team, these are teams that have been there, that have the pedigree. I know it's been a while since NC State has gotten to the Final Four, but they played with great determination. And their style of play and how they attack you downhill in the open court, and come on, seven for nine from three-point lane land for Isaiah James, that's not bad either. Um, this is a team that I've been very impressed with, and I don't think they should be counted out. Give me an X factor for NC State tonight. Tonight Rivers, for sure. And it's not the X and O's, it's the emotional side of it. Okay. He spent her freshman season at South Carolina, so she was there with you know the the now juniors that sure. are, are that are there, and so I think that can have an emotional toll when you're playing against your friends, when you're thinking about that team that you used to be a part of, and I think she's got to be able to put that aside and just play her game. Uh, NC State was out rebounded by 13 against Texas on Sunday. They also allowed 14 offensive rebounds. Uh, or they were out rebounded, excuse me, on the offensive glass by 14 to Texas. If you give up 14 offensive rebounds to South Carolina, that's going to be a very long night for Westmore uh, and company. All right. I need a prediction. I need a prediction from you. Who are we going to be talking about getting ready for the championship after Ooh, the game? Oh, man. Um... I can be convinced. I can be convinced. 
convinced. I can be convinced. Um, you know, I didn't know what I was going to say until I got up here. I, it's really hard for me to count out the experience of Iowa and yeah. the play of Caitlin Clark. I don't think those are two factors that you can take lightly when you get to this stage of the game. I mean, that backcourt, that they have played together, I think, over 130 something games like that's experience that's chemistry that's connectivity um and and, and i didn't think they were going to be here so i don't think that caitlin clark is going to take this moment for granted so i'm going to iowa okay and i've played the acc you picked them to come this far i love the wolf pack but i'm going with the cane cox i'm going with the game cox there is no Defeated and lose in the semifinals? Uh, no, I don't. I don't see that happening. Before we leave, I did just want to ask. We we have all of these fans here. The game of women's college basketball is exploded, yeah. right? Um, record ticket sales, record viewers, record attendance. When you look at what we have seen from the game of women's college basketball, not only in this season, but over the last decades, and all of the strong women who have helped us get to this point. What do you say about the state of women's college basketball in the year of 2024? I am. I heard fire. It's on fire. I it heard is that. on fire. I heard That's fire. One. Um, I am ecstatic for the game of, of women's basketball right now, and, and I, I'm going to take us back. I'm going to take us back to Please. 52 years to Title IX. Right, Title IX changed the game for women in sports, and, and girls had an opportunity then now to even the playing field in terms of the ability and the accessibility of sport. However, there were other aspects that weren't equal. Media coverage, right, was one of them. Sponsorship dollars, the things that really allow a sport to, to thrive. But here we are, fast forward, to the investment that is being made in the game the women deserve this moment. And I'll tell you this too. The last thing I will say, the game has always been great, right? We've had sure. fantastic yeah. players that have played women's college basketball over the years. But the level of play that we're seeing right now in our sport blows my Ooh. mind, right? Um, I was talking to someone yesterday who was at the, the women's final four 25 years ago. And she said, I don't think anybody scored a basket for the first six minutes. And I said to myself, that's not happening tonight. <laughs> okay? <laughs> We're seeing some points on the board. We're going to see scoring. We're going to see prolific rebounding. I mean, the athleticism, the speed of the game, it is so fun to watch. So keep your eyes on the product. While all the rest of it is impressive, the product between the lines is what is incredible. And there are some superstars that we will see take the floor tonight, and they deserve all of this and more. They certainly do. Believe it or not, we are actually out of time. So we're going to go inside Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse and warm up and get ready for the games tonight. We know all of these fans are certainly going to be enjoying all of the basketball tonight with us as well and with you at home. Thank you so much for watching Countdown to the Semifinals delivered by Wendy's. From the China Robinson, our entire crew here and back in Bristol, Andrea Carter and, of course, Lindsey Gottlieb for joining us. I'm Sam Ravitch. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show, everybody.